Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to Chris's Corner. We are now live. I'm about to introduce my guest who I'm super excited to have, but before I announce any uh, topics and guests and everything, we definitely want you in the comments to go ahead and introduce yourselves. Let us know where you're at. Say hi to my guests. Say hi to people watching. Also today, the majority of what I'd like to do in today's Chris's Corner episode is make sure that we are answering any and all OCD and related disorders questions you have. So we are going to talk a little bit in the beginning about how misinformation negatively impacts the OCD community. And, you know, I think that's a very important conversation. We're hearing a lot of people make OCD comments during COVID. We know that there's different treatments that are being used to treat OCD that isn't working. We're having a bunch of people um, putting out different recipes and things to cure OCD. So we're going to talk about all that misinformation uh, at the beginning, but we definitely want to make today about answering your questions. So in whatever platform you're at, make sure that you just ask any question you'd like that's OCD and related. And we would love to answer your questions and make sure that we can support you. Um, before we jump into that, of course, I just wanna make a quick uh, announcement. Um, I wanna remind everybody that this live stream is intended to serve as educational content, is not intended to replace therapy. Obviously, I'm here with a world-renowned expert, but he's not working one-on-one -on -one with you, so he can't treat you. Definitely give you information and direction, but make sure that you are working with a local provider or a local clinician. The IOCDF is not a cross crisis hotline and should not be used if you are in distress or feel unsafe. If you are in a crisis or you are ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room. Also call 911 or the suicide prevention hotline at 800-273-8255. I also want to let everybody know that we want to create as safe of a space as possible and be kind and respectful to everyone. With that said, this broadcast is being live on various social media platforms and is being recorded. So please be mindful of that as you ask personal questions or leave comments. At the end of the day, do not forget that we are all here to support each other. So um, definitely, like I said, make sure that you ask your questions, say hi to your comments, um, and we want to get to as many questions as we can. But I do want to talk about our guest today. So like I said, although we're going to be answering all your questions and, and discussing anything OCD related, we're also going to touch on some misinformation and how that affects the provider community. So my guest today is Dr. Patrick McGrath, who serves as the Chief Clinical Officer of NoCD, which is a platform for the treatment of OCD, leading their therapy, uh, teletherapy services across the United States. He is also a lead psychologist at a Health, where he opened intensive outpatient partial hospital and residential treatment programs for anxiety disorders, school refusal, OCD, substance disorders, and PTSD. He's also the president of Anxiety Centers of Illinois, a private practice group, and a member of the scientific and clinical advisory boards of the Neurointational OCD Foundation. He is a fellow of the Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies and president of OCD Midwest. So everybody give a big welcome to Patrick McGrath. How are you doing? Chris. Great to be here. Thank you so much for the intro and good to see you again. You know, we we had the pleasure of doing this just two weeks ago on the no CD side of things. So I'm excited to be here with you uh, and, and flipping the roles of you being the host today. I was just going to say the roles feel flipped. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <So it's> like, <laughs> um, we already got a hi from India. Hello, Anissa. Thank you for saying hi and shouting out to India. Um, that is amazing. That's what I love about the virtual programming here at the IOCDF. We've been able to reach and touch people from all across the world. So it's really Absolutely. exciting. Mm -hmm. So we're going to jump in, Patrick, like I said, I wanted to jump in for a second and talk a little bit about the topic, but I definitely want to make sure that we're constantly kind of getting some of people's questions asked. So make sure. sure you write your questions and comments. You know, one of the things that I find so difficult, obviously, with our community is there's so much misinformation out there. Um, and I, you know, one of the things that I'm really uh, passionate about is my, in my thesis, I actually did the research of how misinformation affects the provider community. And it has people getting misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, or people getting prescribed medication, but not behavioral treatment. So at NoCD, I'm sure you're getting people from all across the, the country, as well as the world, seeking out OCD specialized care. What are some of the things that you've heard maybe from um, users of NoCD of just different type of failed treatments or things that they've tried that has not worked or as well as the other practices that you work at? 
Well, you have a standard talk therapy, which OCD would love to do for the rest of your entire life, would be to talk about itself, right? Because OCD is very narcissistic and would just love to talk about itself all day long, right? So we know that that's not very helpful. Uh, I think of one post of a therapist I saw who talked about uh, if your children are struggling with something, you should wrap them in a blanket of security and not let anything difficult happen to them in their lives, which goes against exposing people to things that are difficult and learn how to handle them. You know, uh, imagine if you fell off your bike the first time, would you say, wrap your child in bubble wrap going forward while riding their bicycle so that they will never fall and hurt themselves and that will keep them safe? You know, that's that's not the way that we want to approach things. Our therapy is difficult, but it's difficult because uh, it's what needs to be done. We wouldn't do the therapy we do if it wasn't what needed to be done, or at least where the research and the science tells us at this point in time to do it. Now, we've all remembered a couple months ago, there was the controversy of drink celery juice and do these things and that will cure OCD. And here's what I say. If you could show me data that shows that that cures OCD, I'll switch tomorrow to doing what I do. I will I will provide the celery, okay? I, I'll get the Vitamix going upstairs and we will we will make more celery juice than you've ever had in your life. But show me the data, right? And, and that's what I wanna say going across the board. Uh, I, there are so many potentials for snake oil treatments out there for things. And, you know, I like, I have tinnitus. So I've always hearing this ringing in my ear. There's constant things that come out. This will cure tinnitus. This, guess what? Nothing has cured tinnitus, right? And, and so I don't look at a cure for my tinnitus. I learn how to live with it. I learn how to handle it. And that's the way we need to approach OCD too. And there's some people just don't like that message. They don't like the idea that, wait, I'm going to have this for the rest of my life. You are, but you can learn how to live with it. You can learn how to handle it. And that's the message we need to be putting out in the therapeutic community. Well, what scares me, I mean, obviously in my own struggle, we saw so many non-experts that claim to be experts. I think that's the biggest thing that I hear in the community that frustrates is the reason so many people go to, to poor treatment is not because they don't know where to look, but people yeah. are providing resources and treatment that they do say will help. And so people yeah. go and, and, you know, reading the comments of the guy that said celery juice or some of these other things that I come across, you know, people are desperate as everybody yeah. who's watching this knows we are desperate. We want to get help. We want to get out of our own heads. And so people that aren't familiar with IOCDF, with NOCD, with OCD Southern California, with resources are seeing these things first and thinking, wow, somebody's finally going to help my kid and they're desperate. So it's, it's sad that people get preyed on. I know I was in a lot of talk therapy. And as you said, people love to talk about the OCD. OCD loves to hear itself talked about. And I just found were. So yeah. um, I want to ask you another question, but before we go to that, we're getting a lot of hellos from Canada. So hi, Mary. Valerie, one of our good IOCDF lead advocates says hi. We have Beth Carducci from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Lena from um, Seattle. We have a great question we're going to get to in a second by Margarita. And like I said, please ask your OCD related questions. You know, one thing that I, you know, we, we chatted really quick before we jumped on to live is, you yeah. know, right now with COVID, the, you know, we hear cases, uh, cases going up and stuff. There's been a lot of things. I know the IOCF addressed a Target ad that was talking about, you know, um, hand sanitizers, kind of like the OCD's best friend and things yeah. like that. So we're, we're hearing a lot of misinformation right now. What are some of the things that you're seeing and how do you feel that's affecting our community when we're hearing things that are being talked about, like OCD is the thing you need to have to help you yeah. from getting sick? I was watching the news and the newscasters when COVID first hit were in a backyard of some one of the casters house and they were all 10 feet apart from each other, you know, across the patio and the camera was panning back and forth. And one of them, you know, kind of doing the pose, he's leaning on the bench and he's got his hand on his chin. He goes, wouldn't this be time we should all have a little bit of OCD? And I was furious. I, I wanted to throw something at the television. And I've got a blog on uh, psychology today called Don't Try Hard or Try Different. And I wrote a blog that night about this is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, let's switch it for a minute. Imagine saying to somebody who was struggling with weight, why don't you just develop an eating disorder? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, the fury, the absolute fury that that would create if anyone were to say that on television, they'd lose their job, right? But why don't you have a little bit of OCD? 
oh, that sounds like a great idea. Maybe maybe a little bit of OCD would be wonderful. And when we can get away from the idea that OCD is a personality quirk to OCD is a serious mental health condition that the World Health Organization has said is one of the top 10 most disabling things to ever have in the world, then we'll get the respect that we're due. And it's shows like this and what, again, like you said, what we're trying to do at NoCD that really try to do that. The other piece, I just wanted to go back for one second too to the previous question. I'm always wary of a therapist who says I specialize in and then there's 25 to 30 things listed on their list Yes, because you can't specialize in that many things. It's absolutely impossible. And I think you should run away from anybody who says that they specialize in that many things. No, I agree with that statement 100%. I mean, I pride myself as a clinician and a person with OCD. I'm constantly, you know, reading new journal articles, going to conferences, speaking at conferences. I mean, it's important to me. And it's exhausting just to keep up with the changes that are happening to OCD, body dysmorphic disorder, the things that we see in skin picking and hair pulling and hoarding. And so already with OCD and related disorders, then you add on anxiety and depression because a lot of my clients deal with that as well. And so I'm working, you know, on get, keeping updated with that. There is no way I could also fit in PTSD, bipolar disorder, eating disorders, yeah. you know, marriages falling apart, children, divorce mediation, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you just psychosis. Yeah. It, just, it always kind of frightens me. And I think that it's doing people a dis you know, a disservice listing yeah. 86 and a half things. And it's like, no. Um, but I mean, what you just said, also is is super important. I, I remember for me when I was in my treatment, um, there was an episode of Dr. Phil and it was about OCD. And one of the audience members asked and said, you know, asked a question and said, can we all get a little bit of OCD? Then my house could finally be cleaned. And like the whole audience is laughing and Dr. <laughs> Phil is chuckling and everybody's cracking up. And here I am after spending 15 hours of doing compulsions, crying, watching this, and it just really brings our community down. So I think it's super important. And you know, to follow up that question, why do you think it's still such a like punchline? Because you're right. I mean, people don't make jokes about cancer. People don't make jokes about, you know, heart disease or, or things like that. Why do you think OCD and mental health maybe in general can still be such a butt of jokes? I'm going to tell you misinformation. Yeah. 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 I'm going to tell you an interesting story. Uh, I did a practicum down in Jackson, Mississippi during my master's. It was across the street from the state mental health hospital. Huge. This place is massive. Has an iron gate graded fence all around it. And the story is that back in the uh, early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, what they would do on Sundays would people from town would come and set up a picnic along the fence on the outside. And then every Sunday, the hospital would let all the quote unquote crazies out on the lawn and people would sit and watch all of the people who were patients hallucinate and do delusional things and all sorts of things. And that was entertainment in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So we still come from a culture where mental health is funny and entertaining. Right. Yeah. And uh, that gives you an idea. Have you, have you heard the phrase that came out of left field? Chris? Yeah. Do you know where that comes from? No, I always thought it came out of baseball. <laughs> it does come out of baseball, but you know why? No, no clue. The Chicago Cubs had a stadium that was across the street from a mental health center, and the windows would open, and all of the people from the mental health center, uh, again, the crazies who were committed, right, back then, would be leaning out the windows during baseball games, making funny sounds and all sorts of things. And so when something came out of left field, that means that's really weird or crazy. Oh, wow. See, I didn't even know that. And yeah. I mean, just, you know, obviously, like, the, you know, generations, generations that gets passed down. And there's so many things. I mean, you know, oh, the weather's bipolar or oh, I'm so depressed. My favorite artist isn't performing or, yeah. you know, like, OK, you know, she has her hand sanitizer out OCD. And I just I, you know, there's so many people. I mean, I remember the the, you know, finding out the statistic that pretty much about 47% of our population has something that's in the DSM. And to me, that's nearly, you know, that's, that's, if you don't have something, somebody you love or somebody you work with as a clinician has it. So to me, it's like, I've never understood why there hasn't been this kind of like revolution, but what makes me more nervous, like I said, and, and, you know, we kind of alluded to it, 
you know, there's a lot of people that don't diagnose OCD properly. I mean, we've gotten yeah. clients that have come here that it's taken them two or three years to get properly diagnosed because they've had clinicians tell them, nope, you don't have OCD. You don't keep things in line and you don't check things. And they're dealing with intrusive thoughts. And I know, um, you know, at your center, you also work with substance use disorders. And um, through OCD Southern California, I've done some talks because the Orange County where I live um, has the number one most uh, rehabs in the whole country. And I've gone and spoken at a lot of these places. And when I've talked about the intrusive thought component of OCD and all that different stuff, a lot of the people there are, I have that. That's why I drink. That's why I use. Like I have these horrific images of harming my family that I don't want to have. Or, you know, when I'm walking down the street, I have these intrusive thoughts about just like pushing someone into the street. Yeah. And because nobody's ever given me an OCD diagnosis, I always just thought that I was a dark, evil person that needs to drink and get high to make these thoughts go away. And so to me, it's like if we could get the word out of what OCD truly is, I think a lot more people would get diagnosed. They'd get diagnosed early and we wouldn't see that 14 to 17 year span of people getting help. I I once for a person at the Foglia Family Foundation Residential Treatment Center, so where we treat co-occurring OCD and substance use uh, in the Chicago area, sat with someone who was on his 27th detox. And I asked him about anxiety. He said, you know, the first person who ever asked me about this stuff, 20, 27 detoxes. Yeah. And not one person had, had even considered the idea that maybe there was some anxiety underpinnings of the reason why this person was using drugs and alcohol. Insane. I mean, it, it just, it absolutely boggles my mind because, you know, I, I was in physical therapy. I had gotten in a car accident, but there was a, a another person who had OCD tattooed on his arm and a bunch of tats and everything. And I was talking to him like, I have OCD and I treat OCD. And we got into this conversation and he said he got the tattoo because similar story, not 27, but he had gone to rehab nine different times. And it wasn't until one of his clinicians just happened to have a daughter that had OCD and had harm and sexual intrusive thoughts, not, you know, what, what people think OCD is. And the, the clinician said, I think you have OCD. And to him, it was like, I finally got an answer of what I've been struggling with. He's like, I've had these thoughts since I've been a kid and they've caused me so much pain. And I turned to a lot of dark stuff that I never would have turned to. So it's a reminder to me that, you know, it's the OCD. That's why I'm having these thoughts. So, you know, it's, it's the more and more people that get the word out, the more and more people that are not only going to get the, you know, the proper diagnosis, but the treatment that comes with it. Well, an OCD in movies is just checking right, and washing and cleaning. Uh, no one's made a, a, a pretty significant movie about OCD, did I just stab that person? And oh, yeah. did I, hey, look at this comedy. What if I molested a child, right? <laughs> That's not funny, you know? Yeah. And, and so the public thinks, I think from media portrayals that OCD is cleaning and, and is just checking. And they don't recognize all of the subtypes that OCD can envelop. I mean, just basically take the thing you love the most and OCD will screw with it, right? Yeah. And, you know, I, I work, my, my other career, I work in media and we did, I work on American Idol and one of the contestants had OCD and their OCD was much more in, in ticks, in the form of ticks. Like um, to them, they did the ticks because it was to get the bad thoughts get out of their head. And we were able to, I was able to pitch kind of a new story to the outlet I worked for at the time because it was visual. They could see the ticks on camera and the producers thought it was great. And I think that's one thing that, you know, maybe at the community we have to figure out because I don't know if the news will ever, but how do we showcase and discuss taboo thoughts? How do we get people willing to go on these shows, podcasts, and put themselves out there? I mean, I know even in my own advocacy journey, I was very open about the checking contamination and magical thinking at start. And it even took me a while to open up about my harm thoughts, my sexual intrusive thoughts, relationship OCD, and these other taboo thoughts. So I know the more and more people that are open about their journey when they're ready, and the more that we can figure out a way to visualize it for the general public, I think the combination of those things could absolutely help. Yeah, I mean, it's a big push for us at No CD, and, and to even add more and more subtypes to the app that we have so that people will see that there are all of these things out there and the, the No CD community talking about all of these things too and just hopefully bringing that to a wider discussion for more and more people over time. It's a big thing that it's, it's one of our missions to do. Great, doing good work. Kelly says, thank you so much for the explanation about left field. Uh, they're also a big Cubs fan. 
Uh, no. uh, I can't talk to Ken. I'm a White Sox fan, so I can't talk. To <laughs> and I don't even know either. So I'm yeah. like, I'm like, go sports. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm going to jump into some questions. We could get back on this topic in a second. But Margarita um, from LinkedIn asked, how do you think a person with mental compulsions or mental self reassurance seeking can actually not engage in the disorder maintaining mental behaviors? So I think that's a question that a lot of people have is, you know, a lot of the education out there on top, and this kind of ties back into our conversation, a lot of the education out there is how to deal with physical compulsions. If something's bothering me, this is what you can do. But as in Margarita's case, a lot of the compulsions are mental, self-reassurance yeah. seeking. Um, how do you not engage in those uh, behaviors? You know, to me, the beauty of the loop tape as an ERP exercise is so powerful, right? When, when I can expose somebody to whatever it is that is their obsession, that they're trying to always mentally neutralize, and I can just play it on a loop over and over and over again, eventually we're gonna exhaust the ability to neutralize it and you're gonna have to sit with it. Um, I'll give you a quick example. I treated someone who was so afraid of words that he was called, uh, he had five older brothers, he was teased relentlessly. And, he, and this is a social anxiety example, but it's a great example. He had words that were huge triggers for him. If he heard them, it would just kind of put him into a fetal position, right? We, as a team, recorded all of these words on a loop tape. And for five hours straight, he listened to these words. Hour one was really difficult. He was tearful, sad. Hour two, he calmed down. Hour three, he just kind of sat there. Hour four, he said, can I stop this now? I, I'm getting bored. I said, great, listen to it for another hour. <laughs> By hour five, he said, this is the stupidest thing in the world. I can't believe these words ruled my life. I don't care about them anymore and I'm done. I said, yeah. well, that's awesome. Look what that took. Years and years of being overwhelmed was undone in five hours of training. Yeah, no, great. I mean, I, I think in my own treatment, what helped me with loop, loop tapes or with, you know, with, with writing out those scripts is a lot of times I felt that my intrusive thoughts. So, you know, to answer your question, Margarita, a lot of my, you know, looping the rumination that I was compulsively doing was very surface level. So one of my fears was getting cancer. And so I would constantly be thinking all day about how do I feel? Do I feel like I have cancer, which I don't even know how cancer feels, but the OCD thought I was going to know, but I was constantly thinking about it. And what I had to finally start doing is going underneath that and just saying, what is the rumination trying to solve? And the rumination was constantly trying to solve, do I have cancer or not? And when I would write out that, that worry script and then loop it and hear it over and over, you think it would make you more anxious, but just like the example you gave, after hours, I found myself calm. And I noticed that the rationale kicked in a little bit and said, this isn't how people discover that they have cancer. This rumination is a complete waste of time. And I'm not really doing it to solve if I have cancer or not. I'm actually doing this rumination because it's the only thing I feel I have control over with my obsessive thoughts. And it temporarily makes me feel less anxious. So it's no longer about the cancer. It's really just to make the OCD leave me alone. But a better way of having OCD leave me alone is to not engage it, to let it win that argument. To Sure, OCD, yes, I have cancer right now. Great, but I still have to go to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And that actually was much more powerful. But, you know, the last thing I want to say to Margarita, too, is like I hope things like this. Um, there's a really good comment by Mary Thompson about violent harm or sexual intrusive thoughts are misunderstood, underdiagnosed, yes. extremely disabling. Clinicians need more training. I agree. I mean, Mary, Margarita, myself with my ancestral thoughts, those things just aren't discussed and talked about. And I, I see an element of shame and almost like guilt and embarrassment that people that have intrusive thoughts. So I don't know if, if, if you want to speak on that, but that's one of the things that helped me as well is learning about intrusive thoughts and having mental compulsions. Um, I started to learn that I wasn't alone and it made me feel less embarrassed or shamed or that I had to hide. Yeah. I think the DSM, we talked about this a little last time, Chris, but it's very worth bringing up again. The DSM does a disservice to the diagnosis of OCD because it only talks about being anxious. It doesn't say shame and guilt and disgust and all these other things. And it's our job to broaden the definition of OCD that it does bring about shame and guilt and feelings of disgust and dread and all these other things. If we're limiting it, limiting it to just anxiety, we might overlook it because you might ask a patient, are you anxious? No. 
Oh, okay. Well, then you must not have any kind of anxiety based or OCD kind of thing going on. But I feel shameful constantly. I'm disgusted with myself. I'm, I'm suicidal at times because I'm so overwhelmed with all of these things. And we're missing people if that's the case. So we have to look at this from a broader perspective. And I'm glad you brought those words up because it's so important to address. Yeah, you know, my OCD, obviously, a lot of it was anxiety, and that was easy to pinpoint. But what I didn't realize is, you know, my sister, I have a sister around my age, and she looks way different than me. We're both the same parents, but blonde hair, blue eyes. So growing up my whole childhood, kids used to think we were dating because they'd see us together. And, you know, when you're a kid, dating is embarrassing. So kids would make fun of us. And, you know, I used to get so violently ill from that thought. And it was, you know, the starts of some of my intrusive thoughts. But I didn't realize that was OCD as a kid because it didn't make me anxious. It made me feel repulsed. It made me feel disgusted. Yeah. I would ruminate and you know not want to be seen with her. I would have to constantly uh, compulsively tell people, this is my sister, this is my sister, so people wouldn't mistake that. So I never felt anxiety per se. It was a lot of just grossness, disgust, embarrassment, and shame. And if I never would have known that those were components of OCD, I could have gone years never recognizing that that was even some of my earliest OCD signs. Absolutely. And it's, you know, uh, I love Lana. I love love Lana's been on no CD too. So hi, love Lana. Oh, uh, we love Lana. Uh, I see her on my feed sometimes too. Uh, it says, I saw a therapist for years who was very intelligent, but even with a PhD, she had no real understanding of OCD. And, and sadly, that's common. You know, um, there's, there's not enough training, I think, in all of the potential ways that a mental health disorder comes through in a lot of graduate programs even. And that's why I, I'm so happy that I did a postdoctoral fellowship that I spent two more years even after I got my PhD in doing more training and learning about these things and specializing. Now, here's the other humility piece that a therapist has to have. When they don't know something, it's their job to help you find a specialist. If somebody came to me for psychosis or schizophrenia, I have to say to them, this is not my strong suit, but I'm going to help you find somebody who has this as a strong suit and not, oh, good, another session. I can charge for that. And, and isn't that great? No, I, I need to recognize what I specialize in and what I don't specialize in. And for the things I don't, I need to get those people to the people who do specialize in that. It's the ethical and right thing to do. Absolutely. And that's what's sad. I mean, people can have, you know, big degrees or they can have big names in certain areas. But if they don't know OCD, it doesn't matter if somebody has been practicing 50 years working with with patients on the autism spectrum disorder, they can be a big name in that. But if they've spent one or two clients in their 50 year career with OCD, it's not going to be as good as going to someone who maybe, you know, only has been a therapist for five years, but they've worked with five years of, of 100% of their clients with OCD. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get to, I think it's Magadi97, they asked, can su uh, sucking your thumb be an OCD compulsion? I mean, it could be. If doing the su thumb sucking somehow neutralizes an, an obsession for you, it could very well be. Now, then becomes the question of a couple things. Number one, the definition of OCD says you can have obsessions and or compulsions. Although, Chris, I think you'd agree with me. I've never met anyone who had only one of those. So yeah, I, I still I don't know where they get that from. I have no idea. Um, number two, sometimes we overuse the word compulsion, right? I have a compulsion to suck my thumb. Well, maybe it's more of a relieving experience or an intrusive kind of thing. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, not an impulsive kind of experience or something like that. But I, I am pretty strict on the use of obsession. So when someone says they're obsessed with something, I, I really try to stay strict on the definition of it's an intrusive thought, image, or urge. And when it's a compulsion, the compulsion is, for one thing, to neutralize an obsession. Yeah. And, you know, I always kind of ask, like, what is somebody's motive? That always kind of helps me know if something's compulsive. So, for instance, like I used to crack my knuckles. And to me, I know there are a lot of people do that. But the reason it became a compulsion is because if I did it on one hand, if I couldn't do it on the other hand to balance it out, I mean, I physically, physically felt sick. Like I would get I couldn't focus all I could think about is I have to balance it out. I have to balance out. It's not bad. You know, I couldn't pay attention. And it, it literally almost felt like this inhuman inclined to do it. And that was part of my treatment is doing, and it wasn't just cracking my knuckles and stuff. It could be tapping my right shoulder by our elbow by accident. I have to balance it. Or if I touch this, I have to touch that. So it's always a asking like, what is the motive behind it? Because it can be, a, you know, for a lot of children, it's a, it's a self-soothing kind of, um, yeah. you know, to calm them down. So always asking why is somebody doing it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to say hi to Amanda in Texas. We are glad to be here. 
the question's a little bit long, but um, it's from Beth, and she says that she's been in her home since 2020, really petrified to go out right now. She can get her food and take out her trash, but she doesn't go anywhere, and she doesn't let anyone come over. The pandemic happened, and that really made it worse. Um, she's washing her groceries. She's had a, a $600 water bill. Um, she obviously had to cut back because of that. Um, now that the variant's coming out, she's even more afraid. How have you seen someone like Beth and other people um, you know, she, she says ERP is going to walk in the park, which I always tell clients and my therapist told me day one, ERP is tough and hard, but amazing. Um, yeah. you know, we see people struggling in the pandemic. We hear new var variants come out. Um, and you know, as things, the, the guidelines from the CDC have kind of changed, I've noticed that a lot of my clients and people in the community haven't moved on with those changes and are still struggling with best. So how, how do we work with that where we have this, this real threat but somebody still needs to do ERP to get better. I like to find a source of truth. So for me, is it the CDC, CDC or the World Health Organization or something? And I will follow their, their recommendation. So anything above that to me is OCD. Now, I've, I've often in, in the webinars talked about the idea that driving also has with it a lot of risks, right? We, we know a statistic that every time you drive, there's this 0 0.0 whatever chance that you could run someone over with your car, harm someone with your car, die in a car accident. People will still do that, though. But they might not leave the house because of COVID. Now, um, over the long haul, we have to make some decisions then, right? What level of risk are we willing to take? And what level of risk are we not willing to take? Um, if if you want to wear a mask when you go out, I, I hold nothing against you whatsoever. Good for you. Wear wear a mask, right? Uh, uh, I one of, one of my previous students was Japanese. She said, "Heck, before the pandemic, many of us were wearing masks all the time. It's just what we did, right?" So sometimes in cultures, it's just kind of the way the way that it is. However, no CDC guideline says barricade yourself in your home wash all of your groceries to get a $600 water bill every month and do all these other things too, right? Yeah. Uh, if if that was the recommendation, then we, you, Chris and I, we would be supporting that as well. If, if that's what they were saying, we are people of science. We understand that really good scientists have looked at the data and told us what to do and that these are the best things for you. So that's what we do. Uh, those of us who've worked in hospitals, we we live by an idea called standard precautions right? Which means we assume every person we interact with has every kind of communicable disease known to mankind. And so we use a standard precaution in interacting with people whatsoever. We know when to wash our hands. We know, you know what, what kind of distances. We know when we need masks or eye protection or those types of things. When you have a guideline, to me, you, you pick that as the source of truth and your therapist picks that as the source of truth. And you work together to follow that guideline and know that anything above that guideline is the territory of obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm glad you said that. I mean, everything you said is spot on. I mean, I've always believed in science and obviously coming from, you know, we, from, you know, from our backgrounds, um, it is so important. I mean, I, I believe, uh, you know, evidence-based treatments, which is, you know, obviously exposure and response prevention. I love evidence-based, uh, you know, assessment tools like the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. So that's what I've been doing. I've been working with clients to say, here's what the CDC is saying is going to keep you safe. And here's the things that you can do. And it's not just with a pandemic. I mean, it's with everything. You know, I have clients will go to a doctor. The doctor will say, you know, hey, do this. And then my client is adding on all these things. And I'm saying, where are you getting these things from? Well, I just want to be extra safe. And it's like, you know, I always I joke with them. I'm like, your OCD doesn't have an MD. Your OCD hasn't gone to medical school. Your OCD doesn't specialize in, in, in different viruses. So our brain is kind of creating stuff that isn't accurate. And, you know, if you had a little kid on the street that just came up to you and said, you have to start doing these things, you wouldn't listen to him. But for some reason, we listen to the OCD as if it's gone through all these different trainings and has the ability to keep us safe when it really doesn't. And I tell people often, you know, I did a talk once and it was probably, I loved having, I actually had a dermatologist on the uh, panel with me and she was talking to people. It was, it was about contamination 
specifically, it was a talk that that we did. And the, the dermatologist was saying, some of the things that I'm hearing you guys do is actually making you less safe. The yes. constant washing of your hands is making little uh, cracks in your right. hands, which makes you more susceptible. You're washing off the good germs by isolating yep. yourself. This was pre-pandemic. By isolating yourself, you're getting, you know, you're, you're not being exposed to everyday things, which makes you immune to that. So you're actually making yourself more likely to get the things that you're trying to avoid. And OCD tends to have a uh, thing to do that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The very thing that OCD wants you to do can be the very thing that makes you worse. Yeah. Because it's an immediate gratification versus a long-term gratification. Well, you see that in social anxiety, for instance, I'll have clients sure. that say, you know, I don't want to talk and interact with people because I'm going to say something embarrassing. Yep. Then they're going to not want to be with me and I'm going to be alone. Meanwhile, they are alone because they're not talking or going out because of the fear of being judged. So they're yep. living their worst worst case scenario, whereas at least if they go out and try, sure, maybe some people will laugh at them and not want to be their friend. But you have a little bit better odds going out there and trying to make friends than mm -hmm. isolating in your room. And you see it in substance use. I could start the withdrawal process or I could just use and put the withdrawal process off because withdrawal really sucks. Now, using drugs for the rest of my life is probably going to kill me, but at least in the moment, it's going to feel better than going through withdrawal. The analogy I always get is is that short-term relief you get. It's almost like you're on the way to your family's for Thanksgiving and your grandma can throw down in the kitchen. She can make, I'm Greek, so she can make that good Greek food. You're so excited, but you choose to stop and get McDonald's. No offense to McDonald's. Uh, maybe I'll say Arby's. I don't feel like anybody likes Arby's. So I don't think I'm insulting anyone, but it's kind of like getting Arby's on the way to Thanksgiving and getting stuffed on that to get that immediate gratification. And then you get there and don't eat the good food. And you could have just held out for 30 minutes or an hour till you got there and had better food. But I'll be at the uh, Tronson family Thanksgiving if there's Greek food because I, oh, I love uh, Let so. me tell you, and I'm not just saying this, my aunts, my mom, everybody can cook Greek food in my family. Right. Our family actually owns two Greek restaurants in San Diego. So <laughs> you'll have to come over when you're in LA. I, I will be over, yes. <laughs> so. um, I wanted to touch on this. We have a, a comment at 9.29 a.m. my time. I know that's Pacific time from Jan Lana Renault from YouTube. And they said, Two ways of obsession. We have ego dystonic and ego syntonic. That's little scientific yeah. words that we use. But could you explain the difference? Because I think it's super important to people with OCD, especially people with these intrusive, um, you know, kind of taboo thoughts to understand the difference. Yeah, ego dystonic. I don't like it. I want it to go away, but I feel like I have to do it anyway just to be sure. So that's where you would see a lot of people with OCD who can say to me in therapy, I recognize that this is dumb. I don't want to do this. I hate this. But what if? I don't do this compulsion and something bad happens and then it's my fault, right? That's the ego dystonic. It's dystonic. I don't like it. Ego syntonic, meaning hmm, uh, this might be true. There's some merit to this, right? And you can see people, you know, we classify, as you're familiar, Chris, but for all of our listeners, we classify insight into OCD as good, fair, low, or delusional, right? Mm -hmm. to, to no insight. And those are the people where OCD has maybe gone more ego syntonic, where they're like, yeah, this is a good idea. I should be doing these things. This really is protecting and helping me. And I don't really need therapy for that. I need you to leave me alone because I need to keep doing this kind of stuff. That's, of course, much harder to treat. Yeah. And when people have asked me, like, well, how do you know your clients aren't, you know, pedophiles or they don't want to hurt their kids? And I say the people that come into my office are in so much pain, so distraught. Their lives have been completely turned up side down because of avoidance and just unhappiness. This isn't people walking in confessing to me because they're about to do something. So, you know, understanding, I explain that to, to people using those terms, or sometimes I break it down in, in a little bit easier to understand depending on age. But just to understand that the disorder is basically trying to tell you, you want to do something you don't want to do. And the mistake we make is we fight it, we defend ourselves, we argue with it. And all that does is make it worse. Yeah. Um, Amanda asks, Amanda Northern says, I don't understand why therapists aren't trained more in diagnosis. I feel like we need to be giving proper diagnostic tests or tools to help, um, to help therapists to make proper diagnosis. How can we get that accomplished? So what's one way in your mind, um, going back to kind of the topic of today about misinformation, how can we get more therapists or more clinicians or, you know, a fascinating fact I found in my research is 60% of people with OCD first go to their general doctor. So general doctors have even less understanding of OCD than psychiatrists or, you know, uh, therapists at times because they know how to treat everything from a, a, a wound to a cut to this. How do we get more people in the medical field to understand and make better diagnoses? 
Uh, it's a constant push from us. We've we've started a webinar series for therapists to be able to kind of train them more in what is OCD, be it subtypes, be it particular presentations. Uh, OCD in school, higher education is our next one. We're we're constantly trying to make more of that available to people. Now, uh, I always put a push for graduate schools to do more. Right, I think a lot of graduate schools have a focus on teaching someone to do therapy right just and here's the general traits of what a therapist is versus treating teaching someone to specialize which i think there's merits in either way i mean you should learn some of those basic things about how to become a therapist and how to do right by a patient who's in your office but i think that there ought to be some more requirements in terms of helping people to really specialize in something i i'm a firm believer there's enough general therapists in the world out there right now we we don't <laughs> We don't we're really, good. <laughs> yeah, we're good. We're good on that. We ought to be helping people to come up with more abilities to specialize in certain things so that we have that ability. You know, I go back to my own graduate school experience. I audited a class in another uh, uh, section of, of the university that was an undergraduate class. I audited it as a graduate course so that I could get substance use training because in our in our graduate department, we never talked about substance use disorders. We talked mm. about the DSM mental health one. But basically the idea was, well, people with substance use disorders, you know, they have AA and they treat themselves and you have to have a substance use in order to treat people with it. So we're not going to really talk about those and we're going to skip over those. And I was like, you know, I come from an Irish family. I've seen substance use, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I know what alcohol does to, to families and things like that. I want to learn this stuff. So I had to take it on myself to go and get a class in that. And so I'm constantly pushing whenever I do trainings at universities or things to broaden the idea of, of how do we how do we better well-round clinicians in recognizing the various mental health disorders that are out there? And you don't do it in a one semester class of abnormal psych. It's got to be more than that. Well, I was going to say that. I mean, I went to, you know, I'm in California. I went to great colleges. I think an undergrad, we talked about OCD and abnormal psych for maybe five minutes. Um, and Probably. then when I went to, to graduate school, um, obviously by at that point, you know, I had been diagnosed myself. I'd gone through my own treatment. I had been doing stuff for the IOCDF. I was already helping run like support groups with a clinician and different things before grad school. And I remember when we did the day on um, OCD and related disorders and spent that whole 15 minutes on it, you know, luckily my professor was saying things and I could tell, you know, that was not her specialty. She actually worked with trauma. And so she finally just let me like teach the class. She's like, why don't you just come up there? And I did. And it was great because people were asking questions and I was talking about the different subtypes and all these things. And so, but if I hadn't been there, I mean, all of the people yeah. in my cohort would have gotten that 15 minutes, five from undergrad. Now that's 20 minutes. And what I what I try to explain to people is, you know, exposure response prevention is, is a gold standard for OCD. So if somebody doesn't have a connection to OCD and they're going to graduate school and they learn about general cognitive behavioral therapy, or they learn how to work with child children, play therapy, etc. They can help a lot of people. If you want to treat, OC, if you want to learn ERP, that's going to help one group of people. So people that don't have a connection to OCD for whatever reason just don't see it as you know. It just doesn't make sense for them to go into that field. So that's the other thing is I always love when I hear former clients going back to school to become a therapist or parents yeah. of my clients going to be a therapist. Cause I think people that have loved ones or have gone through it themselves, if they can, you know, kind of pave that way, we're going to get more and more specialists, which we need. Yeah, absolutely. We, there's, uh, there's not enough. Right. And we're trying to train people through no CD with that and build our network, but there's, there's still demand. There's still demand. Absolutely. Um, Jane Hillen asks on YouTube, says a therapist wants to discuss depressive childhood issues and postpone ERP. And I'm wondering if ERP should be started at the same time. So maybe before you answer that question, I can make it also a little bit more general. So let's say somebody's coming in with comorbid depression, for instance, and maybe, you know, in, in Jane's case, there's a lot of childhood draw, uh, a struggle and, and trauma, and that needs to be dealt with for the depression but they also have OCD or let's say someone has some trauma or some substance use. How do you find that balance? Do you think ERP should be postponed or do you think it can be done at the same time? And, and what are kind of the ways that you make that decision? Yeah, boy, there's a lot wrapped up in that question. Yeah. Isn't there? I mean, good question, very heavy question, but good question. Number one is the notion potentially that um, 
and I know the word trauma is not listed in here, but the idea that OCD has to come out of trauma, which I think is a misnomer, that there are people who are born and they have OCD and it's just that way or it develops over time and they can't tell me any trauma that happens, right? Uh, now, in terms of the depressive childhood issues, uh, I would want to know, is the person, Jane, even for yourself, if if there's a suicidal experience going on, there's suicidal ideation or plans or intent, right away I jump into those things, right? That That's where I'm going to go first. But I can tell you this, and I published a, a poster on this even, for most people that I've treated, working on the OCD first has decreased people's depression and anxiety and stress scores that they experience in their life without actually even touching those things. So I approach it this way. Many people who aren't specialized will think, well, if you're depressed, that's the most important thing. We have to work on that first. And the reason you have OCD and all these other things is maybe a way to deal with depression. I think it's the opposite. I think this. OCD picks on things that you love and enjoy in your life, right? And therefore, you stop doing them. Now, if you look at the definition of depression, one of the definitions of depression, you have to have the first one of the first two. It's I feel depressed or I've lost interest or pleasure in things that I once enjoyed. Well, what if you've lost interest or pleasure in things you once enjoyed because OCD has taken over those things? Now it looks like depression, even from your childhood, when maybe it was OCD all along. And that's the reason you were no longer doing some of those things and had a real tough time in childhood because OCD was there, but no one had an idea about it was OCD. So it got labeled as depression or ADHD we see sometimes and, and that kind of thing too. So I would have no qualms in that situation if a person wasn't in danger to themselves or others starting ERP right away on the OCD. And I would lay money on the fact that you're going to see that depression score go down over time. I'm glad you said that. When I came into treatment for OCD, I was definitely experiencing depression. There were certain things going on in, in my own personal life. I was dealing with, you know, my sexual orientation, not in an OCD form, but actually like dealing with my sexual orientation. Um, you know, there was some other health stuff I was going through. And I, I remember walking in thinking I have all this stuff to unload. But for me, and what I hear from most people is the OCD was always the loudest. It was the most, uh, intrusive. And I, I don't even know if I could have gone somewhere else and dealt with other issues because the OCD was always there yelling. And I just like you said, when I got better from the OCD and the body dysmorphic disorder, the anxiety and the depression was still there, but it dropped so massively that it was finally something I could even face. I don't even know if I could have faced it before. So I see that a lot of times. Plus, I think a lot of people's depression comes from the OCD and all the things that they're losing because of it. We know that a third of people with OCD don't work um, based on some research that has been put out. That's going to cause depression. People aren't going to be able to see their friends, their family. They're not able to interact with people and stuff. So a lot of times if the OCD is dealt with, sometimes the other stuff can happen. So I, I, I'm always nervous when somebody says that their therapist is kind of putting off ERP for a while. I just have never really seen that be a good, good reason. So that's yeah. why I'm always worried. I've also put off ERP if there's significant benzodiazepine use or drug or alcohol going on, uh, because I don't want to introduce ERP and have someone jump to those coping strategies and then create state dependent learning, right? Learning that I can handle ERP as long as I'm using drugs or alcohol or I'm taking massive quantity of benzodiazepines. Uh, however, if someone's willing to work on coming off of those things in conjunction with ERP, we can create a great treatment plan to help someone decrease those coping strategies while we increase the ERP that we're doing. Absolutely. Um, there's a question we got at 9.40 a.m. It says, my doctor was examining me for schizophrenia when I had repetitive thoughts. This was a long time ago when I did not know about OCD. Um, you know, I, I was misdiagnosed with uh, Tourette's because I was doing things to balance. So the, the doctor thought it was Tourette's. I was misdiagnosed with ADHD because I was difficult paying attention in class, but it was really obsessions. I never got diagnosed with schizophrenia, but a doctor asked me once, are you hearing voices? Could it be schizophrenia? Um, so a lot of people get misdiagnosed with different things. And it goes back to kind of our topic today, how misinformation affects. Um, you know, I know we've talked a little bit about it, but what would be your recommendation for people that have OCD that might get some of these diagnoses? Should they get second opinions or how can they kind of weave out so that they don't start getting, I, I think the thing that worries me is somebody going on heavy medications for schizophrenia when they don't even have it. Yeah, I, I don't 
have any issues with the second opinion. Even if someone comes to me and says they want a second opinion, great, go ahead, please, please go ahead and do that. You know, uh, my wife's cancer. We've had third opinions on just ways to take a look at it and to see if there's any other treatment options or things that are available for it as well too. Any therapist who would be intimidated by the fact that you want to check out with someone else just to get another opinion, to me, not worth not worth their salt in seeing. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't spend my time. Uh, investing a lot in them. I, I think that it never hurts if you want to, to have someone else take a look over something and get another idea and present you another way that treatment might be had. Yeah, absolutely. And and the misdiagnosis is that we hear. I mean, I think uh, I did a talk recently on OCD and ADHD for an ADHD um, foundation. And that was what was shocking to a lot of the clinicians that attended the talk is they didn't realize that with OCD, they could see a lot of the same external things, oh, sure. like difficulty with focusing, difficulty with getting things done, a little bit slower processing because they're, you know, the kids are are stuck with intrusive thoughts. And as we know, sometimes for kids getting on ADHD medication could actually make the OCD worse. Oh, so now they're finding that these kids with OCD that are misdiagnosed are now having a worse time. And so it's just you know, that, that misdiagnosis can really cause uh, wreck havoc. Yeah. And, and those kinds of things are important. You know, I, I have gone to other organizations that focus on other disorders to talk specifically about anxiety and OCD, just to open the eyes of people a bit, right. To just be aware of this. Uh, you know, the, in in cancer, one of the things they look at, and again, I'm familiar, very familiar with this with Susan and her diagnosis, but her cancer is so rare that the ribbon is is a zebra. And the reason it's a zebra is because when you hear hoof prints, you think horses. Yeah. Right? And when when you do specialize, and this is something for us, Chris, to even pay attention to, being very specialized in OCD. When you do specialize in something, it's very easy to see something through that lens. So it's the humility of us as therapists who do specialize in something to be open to the idea that the thing that's in front of me isn't necessarily the thing that I always look for. And that's okay, right? Um, and And my job is to educate people and to tell them when they have OCD, but I think also to tell them when I don't think they have OCD either, but to be open again to, but let's get another opinion on that if that's the case as well. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and that's true. I mean, I was thinking about it for me. It's like, I, we always have to do that as a specialist. We have to make sure we also don't see everything as OCD. And yeah. um, that's why for me, it's like, unless somebody full on has already been diagnosed multiple times and knows that if somebody comes in saying, I don't know if this is OCD or not. I try to take the OCD brain out for a second and just go back into that more assessment brain. Let's collect data. Yeah. Let me hear about what's been going on. How does it manifest? Because sometimes it isn't OCD, you know, right. sometimes it can be something else. And I just, you know, as somebody who was misdiagnosed and got improper treatment, the last thing I want is to yeah. be working with somebody that's dealing with something else. And then suddenly I'm, I'm diagnosing with OCD when they don't have it. So like yeah. autism spectrum disorder, for instance, right. a lot of kids, we call it stemming, like they like to repeat the same things over and over, but it's not an intrusive thought. It's not exactly. causing them distress. Um, you know, my nephew has autism and he will take a truck and he'll literally for hours do this unless we teach him to do a different behavior. So him getting OCD treatment is not going to help him. Him getting ABA therapy will. So we have to to make sure to to you know be careful on our end as well. Yes. I wanted to to put up. It, it's a long comment from Carol Shaplakin, who's uh, Lapin, who's actually out here in California, clinician. Hi, Carol. Carol. Um, you know, Carol's kind of responding back to Beth, who was talking about you know when we talked about following the CDC, the CDC would put stuff out and maybe take it back, and. Carol makes a comment about the challenges taking reasonable risk. And so can maybe yep. you talk about that for a second? Because I think that's really the cornerstone of ERP treatment is OCD wants, I used to beg Jesus to like come down, answer all my questions and then go back up. And yeah. obviously dealing with uncertainty and dealing with reasonable <clears throat> risk is really dangerous or difficult for us. How does somebody work on that when they have OCD? Well, to use your model of Jesus coming down and answering your questions, to recognize that because you had OCD, even if Jesus did come down and answer your questions, your response would have been, are you really sure about that? Yeah. So even that wouldn't have, have been enough, right? Um, 
Yeah, reasonable risk is always where we want to go. Uh, you know, sometimes there's the notion of the fantastic aspect of OCD, and and there have been times that it's been thrown out. Let's jump to the worst case scenario and just throw people into that. I look at at ERP as dipping a toe in the pool and seeing how it works and building from there. Uh, what are reasonable things that we would ask someone to do? Let's say somebody has issues around driving. You know. Well, driving is a reasonable thing to do. Most people do it, right? Uh, so how do we approach driving in a reasonable way to do it? But we want you driving. Because uh, well, to me, what would be unreasonable is never driving ever again. What is a reasonable way to approach shopping? Okay, well, if you want to wear a mask, it's still appropriate to be able to do so. And I think for the rest of our lives will be appropriate for someone to be able to do so. That would be reasonable to do. But Look at all the people who are out in the world who are out every day and, and have vaccinations and aren't getting COVID, or if they do, it's such a mild case because of the vaccination. I think that's a reasonable thing then to ask people to do. I always want to revert back again to science and what does the science tell us? And now th the beauty of science is that science doesn't say we're right, right? Beauty of science says the best evidence that we have right now shows this, and we're always open to other evidence. Now, OCD doesn't like that, though. OCD says, no, I need to know what's right, right? And, and until you can tell me 100% what's exactly right, I don't want to take any risk whatsoever. Yeah. That's where the problem comes in, right? Because then no one would ever drive because there's always going to be a risk in that. No one ever drink water because you could choke on water one, or no one ever eat food because you could choke one day on food or something. You know, we we do risks on a daily basis that we absolutely pay no attention to. All I'm asking you in ERP is to take the risk in the thing you're not risking to make it equal to the risks you take every day in everything else that you do which are also minimal risk. Just just me coming down here in the basement to do this talk was a risk because I had to walk down a flight of stairs and I could have fallen down the stairs, right? Yeah. Uh, in fact, someone I, I worked with the other day broke two of her vertebrae because she fell out of bed, all right? <laughs> now, what's the likelihood of that? One in a billion probably, but I know someone it happened to. So yeah. should none of us sleep in a bed anymore? Should we just sleep on a floor because then we'll never fall out of a bed? Well. OCD might say, that sounds like a pretty darn good idea, actually, right? <laughs> OCD is like anything you could do. You yeah, know, I wanted to, going back to kind of what you were saying, and, and Beth kind of had to chuckle at it too, like, are you sure, Jesus? I mean, my first interaction <laughs> actually with the CDC was my mom's house had actually been tented for termites. And I was so convinced it was going to give me cancer. And I was doing all this research and, and you know, how did it get approved by FDA? I mean, I reached, people don't know this. You can reach out to the FDA. You can reach out to the CDC. And literally, I mean, they don't have a, a line where they pick up and they answer, but they send you material and they sent me material. It is proven that the, the, the stuff they use to, to tent houses for termites is safe in the state of California. It was still not good enough for no, me. And so that's no. what I tell people is you can do what I did. And it was like three months of getting them to send me stuff and answering emails and stuff like that. And even with that, which is the best answers we actually have, um, yeah. I st it still wasn't good enough for me. So I remind people, no matter who, what, where gives you answers, OCD will always find that 0.001% doubt and then take the you know, minute chance and make that the norm. And then it feels like it's a risk when it's not. Well, OCD logic consists of four words. And those four words are, yeah, but what if? <laughs> and as long as you can, yeah, but what if something, OCD is going to win, right? It's going to say, oh, yeah, but what if? Yeah, but what if that? Right. Uh, we don't have enough answers for all the questions OCD asks. And that's why we have to live with doubt and uncertainty, because we can never fully answer everything that OCD wants to know. Yes. And I have I even have a sign that says no what ifs and it's by my my um, chair. And so if somebody's what ifing me to death, I take the sign. I'm like, no what ifs, no <laughs> what ifs, because you can what if someone to death. Um, OCD interrupted who we who we love in L.A. says uh, hi to you. Um, I wanted before, you know, I, I know we're wrapping up, but I wanted to say, you know, one thing that I love about the IOCDF is it has local affiliates, which kind of carries out the mission of the IOCDF on a local level. And Vice President of OCD Southern California here. But we are super excited because you're going to be speaking at our conference on Saturday, July 31st, which is available to everybody because it's virtual. So if people head yeah. to OCD socal.org that's ocdsocal.org they can register and just maybe give them a little hint what is your your talk going to be about well we're going to talk about uh you know how do you utilize 
electronics and the virtual world to assist with therapy. <laughs> I mean, it's what we do at No CD, and so it it won't be a No CD plug talk, I promise. But we're at least going to show people the app and the tools because the tools on the No CD app are freely available to anybody to use. You don't have to be in No CD teletherapy. So we just want to spread the word that there are things like loop tapes and places to put scripts and all sorts of things that are available to you that you can use for yourself as a therapy tool for yourself that uh, that could be helpful to you. Yes, so definitely come to OCD SoCal's conference. You'll see Patrick speaking. Um, how can they find out more information about NoCD? Uh, treatmyocd.com or nocd.com. And uh, we are all over now. We're in Canada, we're in the UK, we're in Australia, we're in the United States. We continue to get more and more payers to cover us by insurance here in the US as well too. Because one of the things that's so important is that many specialists uh, either live in big cities, so are not accessible to those in rural areas, or sometimes are price themselves out of the range of a lot of people to be able to see them as well too. So we are attempting to make this uh, accessible and affordable to the, the masses. Awesome. Thank you so much. So OCD interrupted in the chat, but OCD SoCal, so you can register for our conference and treat my OCD if you want to find out more about NoCD. Also, don't forget um, the IOCDF is having a hoarding conference that is going to yep. be the first weekend in August, the 7th and 8th. So please sign up for that. Um, great resources for hoarding. If you have mm -hmm. a loved one, family member, or hoard yourself, oh, hoarding, don't forget, is an OCD-related disorder. And then the big conference that they're holding in uh, October, October, the second weekend, I think it's the 8th to the 10th, um, they just opened up registration. So please sign up yeah. for that. You know, one of the things the IOCDF is trying to do, especially during these times, is give you as many opportunities to get information on a virtual level. So the conference yeah. this year will be virtual uh, for OCD SoCal, for the hoarding and for the October conference. And we are praying, hoping and crossing fingers that we'll be back in person for the IOCDF conference next year in Denver. In Denver, um, go Denver. It, and it the amazing. OCD walk coming up as well too for everyone, yes. don't forget. Yeah, so they just put up the walk, uh, the 1 million um, steps for OCD. Shout out, a big shout out to uh, Dennis, and he's the reason behind why we have this yep. walk. So please read about his son's story who had BDD and breaks yeah. my heart. I wish I would have known them um, when their son was struggling, but I know OCD SoCal, we are actually having four walks now. We have the LA, Orange County, San Diego, and Inland Empire, but definitely yeah. um, sign We've up for the walk. Uh, We've got five. We've got four already in Ohio and one in Illinois for OCD Midwest. So very exciting. No CD is the sponsor this year. Of the I walk saw that. Too, so excited with that as well. Yes. And, and shout out to Margaret Sisson. She just said hi to oh, both of Margaret. us. We love Best said what ifs in the chat. No what ifs. I thought I, I thought I told you. I'm going to give you the last word, but really quick before I give you the last word, a couple things I always want to remind people of besides Chris's Corner, which will be back in two weeks, we're actually going to be discussing taboo and intrusive thoughts. So please come back, um, not next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. I believe it's the 28th. Um, but don't forget that we also have other great programming. So you can go to iocdf.org slash peace of mind. Um, love Ethan, good friend of mine. He has just Ethan. Liz McInvell, who's my hero. She is going to be back next month. And we have uh, Tom Smalley, who is your uh, 2019 um, Hero Award winner, has anxiety and athletes. So you can also uh, submit questions at iocdf.org slash peace of mind. So Patrick, I'm going to give you a last word. Any final thoughts for everybody watching and uh, interacting with us today? By the way, great, great um, interaction from everybody in the audience. Yes, thank you all. Well, and Chris, always thank you for doing what you do and telling your story and being open because it helps to destigmatize OCD, which is something that we need. And I leave everyone with this. Uh, if OCD was helpful as therapists, we would give it to people instead of help them make it go away. So you'll notice that there's not one of us that's giving OCD to people because we know as much as sometimes still out there, there are people who say, wouldn't it be nice just to have a little OCD? We know that that's not the case. And we are going to continue to support you to get you to recognize that you can live a life even if you have OCD, you can be successful and have OCD. And OCD doesn't have to be the hindrance that it feels like right now at this moment. Really well said. That's a mic drop to me. So thank you so much, Patrick. It was a pleasure. I had a great time on NoCD. I had a great time having you here. And if I don't do this with you again sometime soon, my heart will break. So we'll figure it out. But thank you so much for hanging out. Uh, everyone have a great rest of your day. And I always, always, always tell people before your hit, uh, head hits the pillow tonight, make sure you've done at least one thing to fight back against OCD. Thank you, everyone, for coming to Chris's Corner. We'll see you back in two weeks. And make sure to go to iocf.org for all of your information. Thank you so much.